Good evening to you. This is Robertson Jenis coming to you once again for the Open Question Program, this time for October 23rd, 2019. Time is certainly flying, isn't it? Almost at the end of the year, I'm looking forward to the next decade of the third millennium. Hard to believe, but we are here. Hopefully it won't last too much longer. <laughs> The Lord will come back, and it will all be over. The nightmare we've all been going through. And we'll be introduced to something beyond our imagination for all eternity. What a blessed hope that is. May us all have faith to keep contemplating the coming of the Lord as the New Testament, even written 2,000 years ago, had told its Christian believers to look for the coming of the Lord. It will be here before you know it. This life will be like a vapor, here one second, gone the next, compared to all eternity. So we're here, I'm here, to help you prepare for that eventuality, to keep your souls on track, to keep your body in check, and to march on as a Christian soldier, defending the faith and bringing other souls with you. The more we have, the happier it will be. So, um, we are in our second day for this week. Uh, we had a good session on Tuesday, last night. Covered a few topics, and if I didn't get to your question then, you can bring it to the fore tonight, and I'll be happy to give my expert opinion on your question as it relates to the Bible, the church, the tradition, the fathers, um, whatever I can do to help you see it more clearly and uh, learn from it and put it in your heart so that you can live a better Christian life. That's all we're here for right now. And uh, so we've got a few questions already. So um, as opposed to doing any, any advertisements tonight, I did that last night. Shameless uh, self-promotion, as one of my friends calls it. Uh, I will go right to the question box and uh, see if I can answer uh, your questions as fast as possible so that nobody's left out tonight. All right, so let's see what we have here tonight. Ben is here again. Hello, Ben. Uh, he says, hello, Robert. He says, can you please explain how to make use of the four senses of Scripture, literal, literal allegorical, moral, and anagogical? I understand that St. Thomas delved into that subject. Thank you. Okay, so um, what's the best way to attack this question? Um, I think the best way is to start from what the church teaches about um, what's the most important of the modes of our senses of uh, interpretation, and that is literal. Okay, um, and then the literal, um, the other three senses are basically based on the literal. But more importantly is that you have to understand the literal meaning first in order to go to the next level of the other three senses, okay? And that's important because sometimes uh, the exegete may be tempted to uh, bypass, ignore the literal interpretation, and go right to the allegorical, as if that's more important. And that tendency was um, in some of the church fathers, uh, and Origen was uh, guilty of that. Not that, our, not that everything Origen said was allegorical, but I don't think there was a passage that, our, that uh, Origen read in the Bible that wasn't allegorized in, to some extent. And um, the danger of that, um, and that was because of the Greek Philo, um, Philo had begun to allegorize uh, passages, and Origen followed, uh, that made them philosophical truths and try and try to apply them to 
biblical narratives. Okay. And this got really dangerous because basically what you were saying was that the Bible in some mysterious way was supporting Greek philosophy. Okay. Now I'm not condemning Greek philosophy uh, per se. I mean, they had a lot of strange ideas. Okay. Uh, you know, when you take a, a course in philosophy, if you go to college, first thing they ask you to read and study, and the first thing they'll cover in class is Aristotle and Plato. Okay, so there is a basis for understanding Greek philosophy because of the, the, the two greatest philosophers we have from ancient times, and there were others. I mean, this is not to discount the others that came along, but they were, let's say, the top two. That's why in Raphael's painting of the School of Athens, you see Plato and Aristotle walking down the center, so to speak. All the other philosophers are around them. Very famous painting. I don't know where it's uh, at. In, I think it's somewhere in Europe. But, um, you know, if Plato is walking and he has his hand up like this, pointing up. Okay, and Aristotle is walking right next to Plato, and he has his hand up, do you see the other one here, <laughs> pointing out like this. Okay, now his, his hand is stretched out. Okay, and what Raphael is trying to depict there is that Plato's philosophy is, uh, stresses the universals of existence, and and Aristotle's philosophy stresses the particulars. Okay, now this has been, and why that's so famous and why it's still pertinent today is because there's a constant battle in philosophy between universals and particulars. Okay, I'll give you an example. You see behind me all those books. Okay, so um, from Aristotle's viewpoint, you see how many books there are? Let's say there's... Um, I don't know, let's say uh, a thousand books on those bookshelves behind me. Those are the particulars, okay? The concept of book, if I just said book to you, you don't think of those books back there because th that, would, that would particularize it. Uh, you just think of the concept of book, okay? Whatever it may be, it's just a book, all right? And... Um, you know, th those are two different concepts. We need them both, but the, the difficulty is, is you know, I hope you don't mind me going a little deep into this because we need to know what the dangers of allegorizing are, especially when you go to the philosophical end, okay? And so you need to know a little bit of philosophy to see what the dangers are. That's why I'm, I'm bothering to go into this. But, <clears throat> so, you have universals in particulars, and they fought... Philosophy is fought about universals and particulars from the time of Aristotle and Plato all the way through Kant and Descartes and uh, uh, Hume and Hegel and Kierkegaard and, and all of them, all of them. Basically, if you want to boil down their, their philosophical approach is whether they're going to side with universals or particulars. Even and, and sometimes there's an in-between date called Neoplatonism. We don't have a neo -astro, astro, uh, Aristotleism yet, but we do have a Neoplatonism. And uh, Augustine was somewhat of a Neoplatonist. Okay, now he's, he's so he's trying to take the universals of Plato and uh, Christianize them, so to speak. And Augustine was an allegorizer. Okay, he came from the Alexandrian school. And his writings are filled with allegory. And fortunately, Augustine didn't take off too much into the philosophical area. He tried to confine his allegories to uh, what was scriptural. And, uh, you know, that's okay. But then again, you have a problem because it's like, how are you going to prove what your allegory is saying is true? You know. Uh, we can prove literal things, whether they're true or not, but when you go off into an allegory and you say so-and-so represents so-and-so, that sounds like a good idea, and it may fit with the rest of the Bible, but it's like, you know, how do you prove that? How do you prove that? This is the, this is the direction that the writer wanted us to go in, 
did he want us to take his literal words into this allegorical sense where so-and-so represents so-and-so or this thing represents a, a, a doctrine uh, and, and is that what he wanted us to see? Okay. Uh, if that's the case, um, then yeah, well, we should be searching for allegories all over the Bible. Now, I speak from experience because I did this. Okay. When I was first introduced to the Bible, uh, I read the literal, literal words, but I didn't pay too much attention to them. I wanted to find the allegory. You know, what does this represent or what does that represent? So here we see the gospel hidden in the Old Testament. And that's all fine, you know. It's all, as a matter of fact, it's a good pedagogical device because people that wouldn't normally read the Bible uh, for its literal meaning suddenly get fascinated when you when you give them allegory. And so allegory can be good in that sense. It, it, as I said, a pedagogical device, a teaching device to get them into the Bible. And that, that's all well and fine. But again, it's, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a... Um, I can't think of a good analogy. Hopefully I can do that to uh, explain what I mean better by a picture. But at any rate, so back to Aristotle and Plato, um, you know, you have universals versus particulars. And why is that important? Well, because if you have to deal with a philosophical problem, let's say existence, how do I know I exist? Okay. Or how do I know anything exists? And like one of my favorite examples is, let's say um, you are, I don't know what part of the country you're in, but we have mosquitoes here on the East Coast. And um, if, you, if there's water, around, standing water around you, you're going to be inundated with them in the summertime. And uh, after a while, you just get used to them because there's nothing you can do about it. But in drier areas, you don't have mosquitoes. But let's just say that and so i'm trying to explain why i'm using the example of a mosquito because i'm very familiar with mosquitoes uh so let's say you have a mosquito biting you on the arm okay and we're gonna get deep into philosophy here about this mosquito so uh you, you see him biting you you're looking at him and suddenly the pain starts and you smack him and then not only do you smack him you sort of rub it in Say, I finally got you, little mosquito. And, and you lift your hand up, and what do you see? You just see uh, a blotch, basically. And you might see your own blood there, too. Uh, you might see a, a leg hanging out that you didn't squash. You might see a proboscis hanging out of the mosquito. But it doesn't look like a mosquito, okay? And so the question is, let's say that was the last mosquito uh, upon the earth. <laughs> That'll never happen, of course, but just hypothetically, let's just say that was the case, last mosquito. And you've, you've smashed it, so nobody is going to know what a mosquito looks like because you killed the last one. So what did Plato say about that? Well, Plato said that no need to worry. There's an image of a real, unadulterated mosquito in another world. <laughs> uh, somewhere way, way far away from Earth, wherever that is. I don't know if he meant it abstractly or physically. Uh, but there's the picture of the ideal mosquito up there. And so even though you destroyed it by slapping it, and smashing it no need to worry because we have the picture of an ideal mosquito still in existence <laughs> okay and that's where we get the the famous words a priori you ever hear those words a priori a posteriori <laughs> a posteriori and um, that's where they come from uh, so if for plato uh, the ideal image of a mosquito, so you don't even have gnats, you know, getting me. That's another problem we have around here uh, uh, is gnats. Uh, but it, the ideal mosquito is preserved for eternity in this other world. And so we 
at one time lived in that world. Hard to believe a philosopher would say that, as smart as Plato was, but that's what he believed. We all came from that world, and suddenly we find ourselves here on Earth. Okay, so that's our a priori, that other world we lived in. And that's where we get the image of an ideal mosquito, so to speak. Okay, so um, that's his philosophy, all right? But, you know, in a, in, when we joke about that, but in, in a way, you're going to need a priori knowledge in order to explain how you know certain things on earth. Okay, and Kant. Uh, Manuel Kant had to deal with that issue, and he's probably he probably uh, reached a dead end in his uh, analysis of that. But uh, and that laid the uh, laid the pathway for modern philosophy that just um, was devastating after Kant. Uh, they could no hope, they could no longer hold on to anything and and call it truth after Kant. But um, Aristotle, as opposed to um, Plato, said, well, you know, we can, we can um, figure out, excuse me, speaking of math, so we can figure out um, what that mosquito looked like by um, what he called our agent intellect agent intellect and what that means is we could we could take the pieces that we see we could contemplate what that mosquito was doing sucking your blood out we can contemplate how he got there he had wings okay we can contemplate uh what he must have used to get the blood out this you know long sucking tube and, um, you know, we put this all together, shake it up, put it all together, and we have an image of a mosquito, you see. So what Aristotle has done is taken the particulars, each part of the mosquito that's left, and um, extrapolate from that about what a mosquito actually looked like, as opposed to having the picture of an ideal mosquito in Plato's concept, okay? So that these things may seem simplistic to you, but believe me, they undergird all the philosophy. Is, you know, how are you going to explain how you know things? And that's what philosophy really does. It's uh, called epistemology. That's one branch of philosophy, but a very big and important branch. And that is basically saying, how do you know what you know? How do you know what you know? Okay. So you can see how big philosophy would be. It's like someone could say something, and the first thing that a critic would say, how do you know that? How do you know that? Uh, you know, and if you're not ready, if you're just slight an opinion or your feeling or uh, what you think is happening, uh, without any proof, any, any evidence, you know, you're not going to last long. All right. Uh, so it's basically, how do you know what you know? And if you can't show how you know what you know, then everything comes to a standstill. You reach an impasse. So that's what these philosophers were trying to do. Like Descartes, for example, was trying to get to the lowest common denominator of how you know what you know by saying, uh, uh, ego cogito sum. Uh, I know, I think, therefore I am. Okay. So that was his starting point. And it was thought to be a good starting point because you can't get any primal, more primal than I think, therefore I am. Okay. So that started us out on a whole new track in philosophy. And, um, but Kant came along and basically put a stop to all this and said, look, and, and, and this is how he supposedly destroyed Aquinas's five proofs of God. If you remember, Thomas Aquinas became famous because of these five proofs of God. 
uh, like the teleological argument, you know, the argument from design. How could all these things come into being with intricate design without a creator creating them? And a, a, uh, a, an intellect so vast, so vastly superior to ours to make all these things and have them coordinate and all. Okay, that was one of his arguments. Um, you know, then he had the, you know, the, the first cause argument, which he got from Aristotle. And uh, that was a, a good argument. So, but basically Kant put these all to bed by saying, in, in, in his book, The Critique of Pure Reason, because all philosophers were using their reason. They, they weren't using revelation. Okay, that's the other side of the coin, revelation. They didn't believe the Bible, so to speak. Uh, and the only way they could get philosophical ideas from the Bible is by allegorizing the Bible. Okay? Because the Bible just doesn't get into philosophy. And you know, as a matter of fact, uh, before I go on with Kant, uh, there's a real danger with mixing the gospel with philosophy. As St. Paul told us explicitly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. Okay, so he, can't, he comes to the Corinthian church and he sees that there's divisions. You know, some say I'm of, of Apollo, some say I'm of Peter, some say I'm of Christ. And they weren't saying of Christ, by the way, to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, to say that they're really truly following Christ. They wanted to slight their other party by saying, well, you're not following Christ, I'm following Christ, you know. Or they, So they wanted to slight the Peter party or the Paul party or the Apollos party, you know, not because they sincerely believed. They, these, these guys hardly knew what Christ taught. So, you know, there were basic divisions. I don't know how many there were, but he names at least four. And a lot of these divisions were caused by, Corinth was a thriving metropolis in, uh, in the uh, Greek era and the Greek area, okay? They all spoke Greek. They all knew the philosophers. And they would start trying to make the gospel more attractive to the Greek audience by mixing philosophy in with the gospel, okay? And this is almost like allegorizing because you're, what, you're try, what you're doing is you're saying, well, the cross is a symbol of this philosophical idea, and uh, the the devil is a is like you know uh, um, another idea of a philosophical idea, like like the Gnostics used to do. You know, they used to do all this kind of symbolism, and and so the body became evil, and the soul was the good thing, and constant war and so if you you could use the devil as a symbol of the body so to speak the evil part of you and then there was the good part of you and they were clashing together and in a sense it's you know there's some truth to that but that's not exactly the way the gospel puts it all right so if you go off on that tangent that your body represents the uh, gnostic idea of evil you're not going to get a good understanding of what it is that's happening inside of you as Paul teaches in Romans 7, between the body and the spirit. Okay, you're going to get some distorted concept of it. But it's going to look attractive because you're, you're showing how smart you are because you know what all the philosophers say, and you're interweaving that with the gospel. And wow, <laughs> it, it became a matter of who could present the better allegory, you know? And uh, all these kinds of things foment competition is to who can preach the gospel better, so to speak, by taking elements of the world and mixing them in and, and integrating everything, you see. And Paul comes to them and says, stop it, please, okay? There's only one gospel. We're not worried about the wisdom of the world, okay? We're not going to go after the miracles that the Jews want or the wisdom that the Greeks want. We're just going to preach one thing. Here it is. Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Very simple. Okay? That's what you need to go out and preach the gospel. 
I know, not very attractive. You know, you see a dead man hanging on a cross. And, and we tell them that he's atoning for our sins and all this. Yeah, not very attractive in, in, to the world, that is. Okay, so you're not going to bring in converts by, uh, at least by the droves, you know, because I don't want you mixing philosophy with the gospel. Okay? Let the gospel do its own work. All you are is a messenger. You know, it, hey, like Jesus said to the Pharisees, God create, could create rocks to preach the gospel if he wanted to. But he's given you the privilege of preaching the gospel. That's the way he wants it. Okay? And, but don't embellish the gospel. This doesn't, now, this doesn't mean you can't find, you know, good ways to preach your sermon, your homily, uh, you know, by mixing you know, anecdotes from life or whatever you want to do to try to get the message across. But don't try to make the gospel as if it's some highfalutin philosophy that's the highest of all philosophies. It's not. The gospel is not a philosophy. It's the truth about your condition and about what you can do about it. That's it. And it all revolves around Christ crucified. Okay, so that's it. So, again, you see, what I'm trying to do is draw a picture here of the dangers of allegorizing. Uh, we've went through this before. You know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. It's been done before. Take a lesson from it. You know, just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 to the Corinthians, you know, those stories in the Old Testament were written for our benefit so that we can learn from them, not to go through the same thing they did and be judged by God. Okay, so that's all important. Um, now, um, the literal is, you can even find this in the 1992 and the revised 1994 and revised 1997 Catechism of the Catholic Church, okay, where the opening pages, I think it's around number 80, paragraph 80 or so, uh, where it says that the literal is the primary interpretation that we give to scripture and all other modes or senses come from the literal. Okay. Now, why is literal so important? Well, that's because when we believe that God speaks in propositional truth, he has to say it in a way where his words mean exactly what he says. And the only sense that gives that, the only mode that gives that, is the literal. Okay? Now, sometimes God will speak in a allegorical sense. Let's say, like, for example, when he's covering the sins of Israel in Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23. Very interesting chapters, by the way. If you, if you have a few moments, go read Ezekiel 16. And 23. And there he's talking about uh, the two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And uh, he first talks about Israel and says um, uh, her, her name is Ahola. Okay. And Ahola is a whore. And he goes and describes all the whorish activities that Israel engaged in by using the allegory of this whore, Ahola. Okay, so it's quite funny too how um, how God describes what uh, Ohola has been up to. Graphic language, graphic language, and in the Hebrew, you don't get this in the English a lot of times. In the Hebrew, it's really graphic. Okay, and I wish I could say it on the air, <laughs> but I can't. Okay, it's that graphic. I mean, you think the Song of Solomon is graphic. <laughs> Wait till you see, if you know the Hebrew, or somebody who does, go check out Ezekiel 16 and 23. Uh, and then he goes on and talks about, allegorically, her sister, Judah. Her name's Aholaba. So you have Ahola and Aholaba. And then he, and then he says, and Aholaba learned from her sister, Ahola, 
how to be a whore. <laughs> okay? And when God says whore, he's talking about the fact that Israel and Judah both went off and uh, uh, engaged in intimate relations with the other nations of the world, thinking that God wasn't going to protect them because, you know, he takes too long to do things. And uh, so we want this right away. So let's go make a, a peace treaty with, you know, Assyria or Egypt or whatever. And, you know, we'll show God how to do things. We'll show God the art of diplomacy. <laughs> okay? So, um, yeah, you can imagine what God's saying under his breath, so to speak, throughout this whole dissertation on these two wars. And, uh, you know, this is where all the problems of Israel and Judah started, you know. They didn't think God could do what he said he was going to do. And then you wonder why God demands faith from us. This is the whole thing about faith. It was with Abraham. He had to believe that God could do what he said he was going to do, even though it looked impossible to do. That's it. Okay? That's it. That's faith in a nutshell, right there. And, of course, Israel and Judah didn't think God could do what he, could, what he said he could do, and, and so they fell into apostasy. All right? But that's a big test. You know, Adam didn't think God could do what he said he was going to do. Neither, neither did Eve. They actually thought he was hiding something from them. You know? And that's a, you know, that's a smack in the face to God. That's just one thing you don't want to do ever is question the integrity of God. Okay? And that's what he wants us to believe in, that his integrity is 100%. There's no way he would ever lie to you. All right. And granted, you may have to wait a little while to see God fulfill things the way they should be fulfilled. Because if he does it too early, it's not going to work. All right. And that was Israel and Judah's problem. They just didn't have the patience to sit around waiting for God. We talked about the, uh, the, the uh, Israelites when they worshiped the golden calf. Moses is up there for 40 days and, you know, they didn't have the patience to wait for him to come down. I'm sure he told them, look, I'm only going to be up there for 40 days. If it's longer, I'll let you know. Okay, but don't worry. I'll be back. Didn't phase them. They had to make a God to protect themselves because they complained that they might be destroyed in the wilderness. Okay. I mean, it's just silly. Really, you know, sometimes when I, I think if I had the opportunity after I die to look back at all the stupid ideas I had and all the times I didn't trust God and look at them from the other world, so to speak, I would just laugh at myself, you know. Why didn't you trust God, Bob? He was going to be there. You didn't have to take these other steps, you know. Of course, you know, hindsight's always better than foresight, and that's our problem now. They say, I'm not dead looking at my life and judging it. Um, but, and that's the part of the test we have, is use your foresight. And how do you do that? Well, you go by what God says. Because you know he's not going to lie to you. You know his integrity is never going to be at fault. He's not, he has 100% integrity. All right? So that's how we live. Back to philosophy and allegorizing. Um, so um, the literal is important because, as I said, when God gives us propositional truth, we have to know whether we can take his words at face value. All right? Because if he's always speaking in allegory and never speaks to us literally, then we're never really going to understand precisely. We're going to have an, an inkling, but not understand precisely to understand what he's saying in order to make doctrine for people to go by. In order to make doctrine, you have to have literal propositional truth 
from revelation in order to make the doctrine. Okay, where the words mean what they say, and there's no possibility of them being symbolized into something else. Boy, can you imagine a liberal getting a hold of an allegorized doctrinal statement? They do, they do, uh, you know, buku damage with the literal words that are given to us in councils, like Vatican Council II, for example. Can you imagine what they would do if words were put in allegory? Yeah, well, this this word means that, and that word means this, and yeah, so we can have homosexuality. <laughs> or we can divorce and remarry, you know, or whatever we want. We can allegorize those words, you know, to the hilt to make them say what we want them to mean. See? So um, you have to have proposition, and that's why the catechism and all our councils say that we first look at the literal meaning of those words. Okay. Now, as a matter of fact, I just want to say this too. You know, a lot of our liberal friends try to um, get around the the literal words of the narrative in the Old Testament or even the New Testament by saying that we have to know the intent of the author. Do you ever hear those that phrase? We have to know the intent of the author. Raymond Brown was famous for, for doing this. In other words, we have to know whether the author was speaking poetically, metaphorically, literally, fictionally. See that word? Fictionally? Yeah, we have to know whether he was speaking in fiction. <laughs> oh, very clever. Very clever. You know, like Shakespeare, he, he wrote fiction. Homer, he wrote literal and fiction. Uh, you know, James Joyce, he wrote fiction. Uh, you know, think of any author, okay? That's why when you go to the store or you go to the library, it says fiction and nonfiction, okay? So you can tell the difference. But see how he slipped that in there? That the Bible sometimes tells fiction. You know, just like uh, David Baldacci does in his novels, it's all fiction. And the Bible sometimes writes that way. Does it? And if it does, when do we know that it does? Okay. Well, the fathers had already figured that out. They said to us, we take the Bible as the literal words of God unless there is a clear and distinct reason not to. And Pope Leo the Thirteenth, in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus, said that very thing, and he quotes Augustine. Okay, uh, and uh, so we interpret literally unless there's a reason not to. Okay, now this doesn't mean that we can't interpret literally and then have an allegory attached to it, if we want. Okay, I gave the example of Samson the other day. And um, Samson uh, meets a lion on his pathway, and he, he gets the jawbone of an ass, it says, and beats the lion to death. And he comes back later, and he sees uh, bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Okay. And the narrative doesn't make a big deal about it. It just says that's what happened, and then Samson goes on his way again. Okay, so what do you do with that? Okay, you have the literal words. You know, the lion's dead. There's bees and honey in it. Got the jawbone of an ass. Killed it. Well, the allegorizer is going to look at that and say, "Wow, that's fascinating. There must be some meaning in there." And now he doesn't know whether there is or not. But it, it may be good to, to try to allegorize that. And so he would say something like, well, Samson represents Christ. The lion represents the, the devil. As 1 Peter 5, 8 says, the, the devil roams as a roaring lion. And uh, bees and honey, well, honey, gosh, in the Psalms, honey is, you know, obviously a symbol for the gospel, for salvation. You know, and the bees are like the worker bees, like the missionaries, okay? You know, 
uh, you know, eating the honey and giving the honey, and so to speak. Okay. So yeah, man, there's it's just right for allegorizing. <laughs> okay. So uh, you know, in that sense, it's good. It really is good. Now, the only problem is if some, if some sixth grader, you know, raised his hand in your Sunday school class and said, well, uh, yes, I think that's a great uh, an, uh, allegory there. Can you prove that that's what it means? <laughs> Good luck. Okay. So that's the danger with allegory is, uh, you know, you can play all, all kinds, even if they're good, you can apply all kinds of things to it, but it's not going to get you uh, a convincing argument that that's what the narrative or the narrator meant. Okay, we know he meant that there was an actual lion there and there was an actual Samson. See, and that's where the liberals, you know, they will start saying, well, what was the intent of the author of, of, of this judge's book, uh, chapter 13, 14? What's the intent of the author? Well, if the intent was to make fiction, which he's already assumed as a possibility, okay? He's already told you that before he went to the narrative. Well, if it's fiction, then it never happened. It was just added by a narrator as an historical event to sort of embellish who this guy Samson was. Now, as you know, Samson is pictured as a, um, you know, big, giant kind of a man, muscular, you know, can take on a dozen men at a time and, He's just so strong, it's unbelievable to watch this man in, at work. And so they're building this image up of Samson. And so these liberal guys would say, well, you know, that's just part and parcel with how the Jews wrote the Bible. You know, they're basically trying to, trying to idolize some uh, character in their history as a sort of focal point for everybody to look at and go, ooh and ah, and, you know, like we do with Batman and Superman today. Same thing, you know, they're fictional characters that we ingratiate with all kinds of powers and stuff so that we can idolize them. And we have this all over the world. I know in Spain they call them Kali Man instead of Superman. All right, so they're all over, and that's the natural tendency of people to make idols of human uh, personalities so that they can be idolized and worshipped, so to speak, okay? Like movie stars, okay? Things like that. So, um, and, and the liberals' penchant toward allowing what they call fictional language in the Bible really hurts when we're looking at chapters like Genesis 1 and 2. Yeah, <laughs> you can imagine what they're going to do with that. All right. Uh, here we have uh, a, a, a account of origins where the earth is created first and the heavens and they're unadorned. And then the second day or, or and then in that day, God says, and let there be light. And then the second day he creates a firmament, which separates the waters. And then the third day he creates the plants and trees and all that. And then the fourth day, he makes sun, moon, and stars. Well, you know, for anybody who's grown up under Carl Sagan and Albert Einstein and Edwin Hubble and, you know, all these other characters from physics who tell us how the world began with the Big Bang, and uh, we've grown up with that, well, we, we begin to think that's true. It's actually true. What these guys dream up in their head is actually true. Okay. So when we look at Genesis 1 and we see that the earth came first and the sun and stars came three days later, even if you were going to assign millions of years to the days, it's at, you know, it looks like it's ass backwards. Okay? And so we figure out all kinds of ways to get around the literal meaning because we have to try to coincide with what we think the literal truth from physics is or astrophysics. So it's literal truth versus literal truth. And one of them's got to go because they both say something different. What's go which one's going to go? Well, of course, it's the Bible. We'll fictionalize that because that's easy. That just takes a spoken word. It's fiction. 
you know, Raymond Brown says, it's all fiction. Oh, yes, yes. The great president of the Pontifical Biblical Academy, appointed by John Paul II. You know, everybody follows. And that's what it's all taught in Catholic seminaries today, because of that. And in his commentary, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, he has a whole section there on evolution. Probably about 20 pages in the back of the book. Okay, so <laughs> we know where he's coming from. He's not going to take the Bible literally. All right? So that's why, you know, you don't want to get into this interpreting other than the literal, unless for some reason you must depart from the literal. Okay? And, you know, let's say the uh, book of Judges, again, back there, I think it's chapter 5, verse 20, it says, and the trees clapped their hands. Okay. All right. So, first of all, trees don't have hands. And second of all, they don't clap. Okay. So, what do you have here? What kind of language is that? Well, it's not literal, but it, it's like allegorical uh, because it's what it's doing is it's taking the sounds of the leaves that the when the wind blows, the leaves move and they bang into one another. Okay, and you can hear you call it the rustling of the leaves, and in order to uh, personify the tree, okay, personification, you say the tree was clapping its hands at an event that was going on at the same time. Okay, uh, so you you have a mixture of literal and allegorical there. Okay. And you have to appreciate that about the Bible because it often does that. All right. Um, but I think I'm making the point. All right. Uh, the moral, of course, you know, hey, you know, every time I read a Bible story to my children uh, or read about the lives of the saints and I go through, I say to them, what's the moral of the story? What's the moral of the story? You've heard that before. Okay, and that's all that is when we talk about the sense of the moral. What's the moral of the story? What can I get out of this that is a truth about how I am to behave in my human life, in my Christian life, in my attitude toward God, all that? Okay, that's where you get the moral. And the anagogical would just be basically how, how does this narrative relate to Christ. Okay, so, you know, let's say Joseph in the Old Testament is a great type of Christ. So you have a lot of anagogical application that you can apply to Joseph uh, in that sense. You can do it with David, you can do it with Moses, you know, Noah, Abraham, you know, there's a lot of what the Bible calls typology where you have the anti-type, that's the figure in the Old Testament, that is a type, Christ is the type, of the anti-type, okay? And, uh, you know, that's constantly going on in the Bible, all right? Even Adam, you know, there's the first Adam, and 1 Corinthians 15 says there's the last Adam, or we, we may say the second Adam, that's Christ, okay? So, even the Bible is using that anti-type type, type uh, understanding of the relationship between Adam and Christ. And that's very useful because when you come to passages like Romans 5, where it's comparing what Adam did to what Christ did, uh, you know, that anti-type type paradigm that you have established is very good in understanding what's going on in Romans chapter 5. Okay? So, I am sorry, folks, but I spent 50 minutes on that one question. But, you know, your questions are so good. I mean, it's just, <laughs> they are really good, and you get me going, all right? So it's hard to stop me once I get going, and I know I promised I would get to the other questions. I may have to go over time tonight, so at any rate. Uh, Prebent says, hello, Robert. St. Ignatius of Antioch mentions the Catholic Church in one of his letters, but on a, 
discussion I saw on the internet, one person argued that St. Ignatius did not use the word Catholic. Can you comment on this, please? Uh, well, uh, what I know is the same thing you know, Freeman, is that St. Uh, Ignatius used the word Catholic. Now, what he may be arguing here is that, you know, Catholic is the word universal, okay? So he may be arguing that St. Ignatius is using, uh, and he spoke in Greek, okay? So he may be using the Greek word for universal. Um, uh, so that, what that would do was lessen the possibility that he was speaking about the Catholic Church at large, you know, the Catholic Church, headed by Peter and the Apostles, all right? That may be his argument. I haven't looked at that passage in a long time, okay? Now you're going to make me look at it. So I am going to make a note here to look up um, St. Ignatius's quote on Catholic Church, and I will get that information for you next week. Okay, so, but I think that's where your, your anti-Catholic comment is coming from. But I have to look at the context again of that, okay? So, give me a little time. Vincent says, hello Robert, many Eastern Orthodox make two very pointed attacks against the Catholic Church, that being on the papal off, that being on the papal office and on the filioque. First, they state Pope was not a formal title of the Bishop of Rome before the sixth century. Oh, you have a long question here, Vincent. Uh, Protestants make a similar claim, particularly against ever calling Peter the first Pope. Can you provide a brief history of this term? And even if the term is of late development in describing the Bishop of Rome, why does it not delegitimize his position or office? Second, was the Nicene Creed ever dogmatized? There are many apologists out there lately attacking Rome over the filioque cause because of the Nicene Creed, especially when Pope Leo had the original creed inscribed in stone in Rome without the filioque. They constantly attack Rome over the insertion of the filioque, calling it heresy and saying it leads to the subordination of the Spirit to the Father and the Son. Can you briefly provide any of your expertise to this topic on why saying the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son is not an aberration of the original creed, is not heretical, and why Latin theologians and the Pope are justified in inserting this phrase? All right. Well, because you have a lot of passages in the New Testament that say in a, not, you know, explicitly, and but a little bit more than implicitly, they will say that the Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. <clears throat> or even if you say a passage like in Romans 8, I think it says Christ's Spirit. Well, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay, in the Greek, that would be a reference to the Holy Spirit. Um, the reason it's not the subordination of the Spirit to the Father and the Son, uh, well, look, the Son is already subordinate to the Father. Okay, that's why the Son obeys the Father. The Father is the head honcho, so to speak. All right, the Son, although he's equal in glory and divinity with the Father is still subject to the Father. Okay, that's <laughs> Catholic theology. That's biblical theology. All right, I mean, constantly hear Jesus saying, I do what my Father tells me to do. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with the Christ being subject to the Father. There's nothing wrong then with the Spirit being subject to both the Father and Christ. Okay, uh, there's nothing wrong with subjecting yourself for the purposes that are manifested by the Trinity to perform. 
create the world, save souls, blah, 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 all that, okay? And even Jesus says at the end, uh, the, everything will be all in all in God. There won't be any need for this uh, subjection of Christ to the Father or the Holy Spirit to the Christ and the Father because God will be all in all, okay? Right now, there is a uh, progression or a subjection because of the fact that God created the world and they have to save mankind now. And so each person of the Trinity basically has a job to do, okay? And um, it's all directed by the Father. So there's nothing wrong with that at all, okay? They're all co-equal. Uh, there's no... Uh, dignity lost by the Holy Spirit. He's still God. Jesus is still God, okay, in substance. And they all share that same substance, but they all have different functions, okay? And that's the mystery of the Trinity, okay? So um, that's why there's nothing wrong with it at all. Uh, you know, and the, the Eastern Orthodox, they're not going to give up this idea, okay? It's deeply buried in their history. And this is a problem with, with schism, as I said on one other program. Once it happens, it ain't going back. It hasn't happened once yet in history. So, you know, we talk about a schism happening under the papacy of Francis sometimes. Some, I've heard some people talk about that. And, you know, if you go that route, there ain't no turning back. Okay? Um, and that's the danger of it, okay? And it's better to fight the battle within the church than outside the church. Once you, once you surrender the church to these people that you want to form a schism from, um, you've left the church to them to run and rule. And you're outside. You're, you're outside looking in through the windows. There's not a thing you can do about it, okay? So... It's best, like a lot of good apologists are doing now, to take the battle inside. And like Canon 212 says, we bring these things to their attention, that they have to pay attention to them. I did this once with the old covenant issue about what? How many years ago was that? Uh, 11 years ago. You know, there was a heresy in the United States Catechism for Adults on page what? What was it? 131 said that the Old Covenant was eternally valid for the Jews. And that's an out-and-out -out heresy. So I wrote to the USCCB, I wrote to the uh, CDF, where, and when Cardinal Levada was its, its head, he just died a few weeks ago, and um, got it changed, okay? That heresy is supposed to be out of the Catechism in the second edition. We'll see about that, of course, but at least we can work if we stay in the church, we can work in the church to help clean up the church, okay? But if we're outside, you know, <laughs> sorry, out of luck, brother. There's nothing you can do, okay, until that schism is cleared up. Uh, okay, so there will, let's see, I'm having a problem getting up here. Okay, so now your other thing was about the Pope. Um, yeah, uh, the word Pope wasn't used right away um, uh, it, it, because it was a, it's a familial term, not a doctrinal term. Uh, pope, uh, the, the Italian is Papa, you know, he's our father, Holy Father. So these names developed in time, okay, and if you want to ingratiate your Pope, uh, you're, you're the Bishop of Rome, uh, and you want to show the uh, kind of relationship he has with his, his uh, Christian people, well, it's not going to be dictator. It's not going to be uh, president. It's not going to be um, uh, viceroy. You know, it's the, the, the church picked a very simple familial term, Papa. He's our Papa. And, you know, just like God is the Father, well, the Pope is our Father. He's like the, the vicar of the Father, so to speak, okay? And we treat him like he's our Father, and he treats us like 
he's our father. And how do fathers treat their sons and daughters? The tenderest way they possibly can and get the point across, okay? It's not an employer-employee relationship. It's not a government official, citizen relationship. None of that, okay? Ours is different. Our relationship in the Catholic Church is different than the world's. Ours is father, son, father, daughter. That's it. And you can't get any more, um, you can't get any more gentleness out of a man than when you see him deal with his children. As hard, nailed, or as strong emotionally a man may be, okay, you see that all, you know, not dissolved, but you see it all uh, ameliorated, so to speak, when he's dealing with his children. He will treat them as tender as he possibly can, but he will, you know, he will want them to do what he wants them to do, okay? But in the tenderest way possible, with lots of love and kindness and patience. You know, that's what Paul teaches in Ephesians 6 to the fathers. Don't exasperate your children. You're not dealing with, uh, when you deal with your children, you're not dealing with people of the world that you have to confront every day who are out there trip you up okay you're dealing with your own flesh and blood and so be tender to them be kind be firm and resolute but be do it in a very kind way okay because you're family so that's how the, the church developed this idea in the first three centuries it was a lot harder because man uh, you know we were trying to find out what the bible was number one we had heresies of flinging around the church left and right because nobody knew exactly what the doctrine was or if they did it hadn't been disseminated you know uh, to where it was crystal clear and held in stone uh for these churches uh so there was a lot of flux going on at that point in time and so the church uh, the the pope may have been more like a general you know get that heretic get this heretic you know you know, we got to clean up this mess, and you had to be hard to do that, okay? But after a while, once things were settled, the church began to see what it was and how it, func it is to function and basically how long things may go on. The whole attitude toward the Pope was changing, and, and now he became the Papa more than he was just like the controller now, uh, like a father controlling his household, once that household was established, you see. And so that's why that name would fit properly, okay? Um, but everyone, you can, and you can see that when you read the fathers, like let's say you read Gregory the Great, okay, fifth century Pope, and you read all the letters that were written to Gregory the Great uh, from all the other bishops of the churches in Europe and in the East. Yeah, from the East too, writing to Gregory. And Gregory's writing back to them, okay? Dozens and dozens of letters that Gregory wrote right around the time of Augustine, okay? and. You see them, Gregory, is it okay to do this? Gregory, uh, this happened. What do you, what do you uh, suggest we do? Or uh, not suggest, what do, you, what do you think we should do? We, we want your advice on how to handle this problem. We have this heretic over there. He said this, what shall we do with him? You know, all kinds of these letters are being written to the Pope in Rome constantly. And he takes the time to answer each one. And we have those, okay? So uh, why, why are they writing to the Church of Rome, to Gregory, who's the Bishop of Rome, even if he wasn't called the Pope? Let's just say the, the word Pope hadn't come yet. Why are they writing to this guy? Okay? There's only one reason, because everybody recognizes that he's the leader of the Church, and he resides in Rome as the Bishop of Rome. 
Okay, that's why. All right, and we have popes even prior to that who are receiving letters from all the other churches around the uh, uh, the uh, continents, that the ones existing at that time, Africa, Asia Minor, Europe, all writing to the Pope, even prior to Gregory the Great. So why are they writing? Okay. Well, there's only one reason. Okay, They're, because he is understood as the leader of the church, just like Peter was. In Acts chapter 15, you know, I mentioned this before. This is where they get the paradigm from. In that chapter, the uh, apostles, the uh, priests, the bishops, the Pharisees are even there. Paul is there. Barnabas is there. And they're all discussing whether Christians should be circumcised. And nobody's coming up with an answer until Peter stands up in verse 7 and says, this ain't going to be. We are not going to have Christians be circumcised. Any, you know, not any longer because they were never, well, they may have slipped through being circumcised, but it was never a practice in the Old Testament, and we're not going to make it a practice in the New Testament. He stands up after he says his words. Everybody, it says, and everybody was silent. <laughs> Talk about taking control of a meeting that's in a total uproar, laying down the law, and everybody is just like, whoa. Yeah, they're silent. If you, could, if you could write the Bible in colloquial language, that's what it would be. Whoa! All right? That's what happened. So right from the get-go, we see who's in charge, and everybody recognizes. There's no, Paul doesn't stand up and say, hey, who are you? You know, we're Barnabas, you know. The only ones who might have been grumbling there were the Pharisees. All right? Nobody's doing that. The next thing that happens is that James stands up and says, okay, you heard what Peter said. Now here's how we're going to implement it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, come on. I mean, you know, I give that passages, those passages to Protestants, and they just, well, no, James was the leader of, of, of Acts 15. Peter, he, you know, he's the one who was the Bishop of Jerusalem. He's taken over and blah, blah, you know. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. I mean, here it is. Clearly, Peter says the doctrine. James does not say the doctrine. He just tells them how to implement the doctrine and to help Peter. But Peter's the one who made the doctrine. And this goes right over their head. Why? Because they're pre-programmed to look at this and say it didn't happen the way the Catholics think it happened. You know, that's the time you pick up your Bible and you walk away. Okay? Let them think about what you told them. Don't argue with them. Just go away. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of battle we're in, but we just keep saying the same thing saying the same thing, and sooner or later, whether it's here or in the next life, they're going to figure out what the truth is. All right. Um, let's see if I have everything. Roe says, in your book, Not by Faith Alone, on page 101, you say that in the book of Revelation, Jesus the Lamb is seen as standing before the throne as opposed to on it. Is Jesus said to be sitting on the throne at any point in that book? Well, in uh, Apocalypse 3, um, it says he's sitting at the right hand of God. Um, so I'm not sure, not by bread alone, I say that he is um, seen as standing there. There's, I think there's a reason for that, uh, Ro, but I can't remember what it is. Um, that's another note I will make to myself. All right, so not by bread alone, page 101. Standing as opposed to sitting. I know there's a reason for it, I just can't remember it. And I will let you know, okay? All right, Kate says, hi, what do you think of Father Kramer's line of thinking that Benedict is still Pope? He just finished a book on him. Do you agree? No, I don't agree. Um, 
Father Kramer is a um, very independent thinker. I'll give him that much. Um, but, and, and even if he was right, Father Kramer was right, okay, I'll, I'll uh, grant him a possibility of being right. I'm not saying I agree with him, okay? Even if he was right, there's nothing you can do about it, okay? The danger, however, is that what he will do about it is he won't give Pope Francis the respect of being a pope. And he will, he will continue to act, at least in his own Christian life, as if Benedict's the pope. How he's going to do that, I don't know, uh, because Benedict is not acting as the pope. But um, now the danger, so the danger then is if Father Kramer, writing a book about this, is now proclaiming this as not only his opinion, but more than that, it's more than an opinion. It's actually it's an actual fact. He believes that is true, and he is now allowing himself to persuade you of that truth. Well, I think he's crossed the line. Okay, you want to? You can have all the opinions you want about who the Pope is. You know, even if we do have a Pope, you can think all those opinions you want. But that's where it stops. Okay. Uh, if you've written this, if he has written this book in order to say, I am making a statement of fact that, that Francis is not the Pope and Benedict is, um, that's to me crossing the line. Okay. Uh, if he wrote in the book that this is just my opinion and I as a Christian have the right to express my opinion as Canon 212 says, to my pastors and to all the Christian faithful, I can express my opinion, but uh, I am subject to the magisterium of the church, and if they declare me wrong, I'm wrong, and therefore I submit this as my opinion. That's okay. That's okay. He has the right to do that. I haven't read his book, so I can't tell you uh, in which format he put it in. In other words, is it just his opinion, and he lets it know his, his opinion, or does he think it's dogmatic fact that Benedict's still the Pope and Francis isn't? Okay, big difference on how you approach those two uh, polarities. Okay, so that's as far as I can go on this question because I, I haven't read his book. Okay, now as far as uh, the idea that Benedict is still Pope, you know, that would say that all Pope Benedict's attempts to resign from the papacy are not permitted. But I don't know of any rule that any pope or council has made that a pope can't resign from his office. You know? Um, so I don't know where they're getting this from. I really don't. Uh, the pope is the head, and nobody can question his action as long as it's not sinful. Uh, so if he decides to resign, I can't, I'm not going to do this anymore. Who's going to question him? Our own canon law says we can't question him. He, he's dropping out of the race. For whatever reason it is, it doesn't matter. It must have been a good one for him because he dropped out. Now, I, I, I wish he never had dropped out because he left us to the wolves, so to speak. I mean, the very thing that he wanted to be Pope for in 2005, and he tried darn hard to do it to keep the wolves away from us. Now, all of a sudden, in 2013, uh, he says he can't deal with the wolves, and, and you know, that's okay, but come on, that means the wolves are going to come after us. And you can, you know, go rest in uh, what's that, uh, papal residencies, or not the papal residence, um, Chris Gandolfo, is that where he's staying? I don't know. Or maybe he has an apartment outside of Rome, writing his books. Well, that's fine for you, you know, but you were given a job to do till the end, and you reneged on it. So I have no respect for him. I really don't. And even when he was pope, you know, he, he followed through with the Assisi meetings, just like John Paul II. And, you know, you look at his writings, he, some, you, you know, you read one from Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he's 
conservative. You read him from Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and he's a liberal. You never know which end of the stick he was on. Okay? But at least he was in line enough with our tradition and didn't want to go to any extremes that he could hold the wolves, who were much worse than he was, he could hold them at bay. And, um, you know, so to give up the fight to me, I, I just, no. All right, let me look where we're at now. We're, we're talking about an Amazon Synod. I don't think that would have ever occurred under uh, Pope Benedict. Okay, at least not until after he died. So, yeah, that's a s s sad state of affairs. But the fact is, if he wants to resign, he can resign. There is no canonical law against that. And, um, and there's nothing in the church against it. So, And we had one pope before who resigned. So we have precedent for it. Okay, so I don't know how Father Kramer is arguing the case that uh, Pope Benedict is still the pope. To me, that's just nonsensical. Um, Robert says, how does a parent whose faith continues to grow, but earlier in life was weak or barely existent and was not good at handling on, handling on the faith or catechizing in the past, but now is praying a lot, trying to catechize and worries about their steadfastness of the children's faith now. I know it brings out the most awesome responsibility of parents, but how does a person make sense of this considering God's mercy and justice? Well, I have to admit, Robert, I'm not quite clear on where the question is in your question. Um, let me try to read it again. Um, okay, so you're worried about your past, it looks like, and how if that's going to have an effect on how you're treating your children in the present that's what i'm gathering from your question and um i would just say something very short and simple to you uh, the past is the past you're never going to change the past um and you live in the present and because you're a christian and you have the holy spirit working in you you have the power of prayer. You have the power of your own conscience. Uh, you have your Christian fellowship in the church. You have the mass. You have the sacraments. You have all those things to help you. You have the Bible that you can read. Hey, and believe me, you're not the first one this has happened to. Okay? Yeah. Read those stories in the Old Testament. Yeah. Those, those stories were picked out because of all the sinful things these people did, okay? Not because of all the good things they did. I mean, there were some good things in there. But those stories are picked out to show the sinful parts of their lives and show why we need a Redeemer, okay? So go find out how they lived. I bet you your life is better than theirs, a lot better, even your past life, okay? Now, I'm just guessing here, all right? But... You know, don't look at yourself from the past and let it haunt you, all right? You are a new creature in Christ. That's what Paul says from 2 Corinthians 5, 17. A new creature, all right? Granted, you have the old man with you, as Paul says in Romans 7, okay? And you have to carry a little bit of him around with you, but you have the new man that can conquer the old man. That's what the Christian life is all about, okay? And you're in that crucible. So live it, man. Okay? Live it. You have the power. If it wasn't true, God wouldn't have told you. He would have said, give up. Robert, you don't stand a chance. No, that's what the devil wants you to hear. That's what he's telling you. So when you hear those voices in your head, you know where that's coming from. You've been influenced by the devil. Because he says to you, Robert, give up. You'll never train these children, right? Okay? Don't bother. But God says just the opposite. Who's the liar? The devil's the liar. Okay? So, I mean, in the short time, that's all I can give you, the advice, Robert. But you just 
keep praying the rosary with your children. You keep going to mass with them. Take them to confession. Okay? You know, at least once a month, if not more. Just get them trained in that whole idea of confessing sins. Make sure they get their confirmation. Okay? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've baptized them all. All right? Uh, make sure they receive the Eucharist and teach them about the Eucharist before they receive it. Let them know what they're doing. Okay? You just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Don't falter every day. Whether you wake up in a good mood or a bad mood or you had a bad day before or not. You just wake up. It's a whole new day. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And you go right from there. And you do exactly what you're supposed to do. Okay? Hope that helps you. All right. All right. Um, Hiroshi says, okay, I'll go for five more minutes here until 8.30. Professor, Professor Dale Martin on hermeneutics, lecture at Yale, quite akin to the four senses. He's an Episcopalian, by the way, but often hangs out with Thomas Catholic, just like the Catholic bigwig Raymond Brown. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that link. Um, Malcolm says, what happened to your old articles on CatholicINTL.com? Uh, still in my hard drive, uh, Malcolm. Uh, the problem is finding the time to get to them all, figuring out which ones I should put up. Um, yeah, I got so much work to do. I just can't keep up with it all. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good articles on those on that old website. And I don't have that old website uh, link anymore. Someone got it out from under because I forgot to pay the bill. And um, now wants too much money to get it back. Um, so yeah, it's another problem with that. Um, but I'll try, you know, I'll, I'll give it some thoughts, see if I can put uh, some time in there. I mean, there's hundreds of them there. That's, that's the difficulty is there's so many of them. And a lot of those topics, you know, are passe. Um, you know, they were relevant when I wrote them and are not any longer, you know, because they deal with like Pope John Paul II or uh, some other stuff. Uh, there are some that are relevant, you know, and those are the ones I want to sift out and put back up, but it just takes time. I got to go through them all and... I'm trying to get this Bible done. That's that's my chief focus right now. This Bible commentary I talked about last night. Um, I spend all my time doing that. And if I get distracted with something else, then uh, it's just it's too much. <laughs> too much. All right. Um, Clinton says, Hi, Dr. St. Janice, from my experiences with Eastern Orthodox folk, they seem to hold in disdain, St. Augustine and St. Thomas, why do you think this is the case? What are some things we need to consider when speaking to them? We've been trying to figure that out for a thousand years, Clinton. And uh, nothing seems to get to them. Um, you know, I hate to say this, that just let them go on, because I never want to give up with people. But there's not that many of them, first of all. I mean, what, 250,000, 300,000? They haven't increased in numbers a lot. Uh, so it's not, I mean, it's like, why are, is everybody so worried about the Eastern Orthodox? Um, they did what they did. They're paying the price for it. And just like the Protestant reformers, you know, they're paying the price for what they did. Um, now I don't want to be crass about it. I, I, I want to empathize with the situation, but it's like, you know, what do you say to people that just don't want to bow down to the Pope? I mean, there's not much more. All this other stuff is just window dressing. You know, what they think about St. Thomas or St. Augustine, uh, you know, it's just not relevant. The, the, the relevant thing is they don't want to bow down to the Pope. And consider him not one among equals, but the head of the church. Okay, that's it. Once they accept that, 
then they, they, will, they will accept all the other doctrines because the Pope has declared what these doctrines are. You know, and, you know, that's, that's where the, the issue lies as far as I'm concerned. All right? So if you don't want to bow to the Pope, then you're not going to be Catholic. All right? That's all there is to it. You can go fight your own battles. You can figure out your own doctrine. Okay? So that's, if you don't want to take it from the Pope, there's nothing we can do for you. Uh, Donald says, you were more recent than that. You write a 41-page response to Pope Francis's new evangelization. Did any bishops respond in the U.S.? Did I write a 41-page response? That was on the Old Covenant, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that was it, Donald. Um, yeah, because as soon as he became Pope, first paper he wrote was to say that the Old Covenant wasn't revoked. First paper. So I knew it was going to be uphill climb with him from day one. And then so and then again, so I wasn't surprised when he came up with all this other malarkey that he's talking about. And um, yeah, so, but I think that's the paper you're referring to. And I think that's still up on the internet. I think that's on robertsongenis.org. As a matter of fact, I think it's right on the homepage, if I remember correctly. All right, so um, Clinton says, Hi, Dr. Sengenis, from my experience with, okay, you already had that one. All right. Okay. Um, so Ro says, if you read James Lacutus, you might find an answer to that question. Yeah, I think you probably would. Um, I, I know James. I've talked to him at length about the Eastern Orthodox problem. That was many years ago, however. Um, and he was old then. Is he still living, James Lacutus? I, I haven't heard anything. I hope he is. But, um, yeah, I mean, if there's one authority on the Eastern Orthodox problem, it's James Lacutus. I mean, he is uh, from the East, I believe. And um, he has a lot of sympathy for the Yeah, He asked me to get involved with him. And uh, for the reasons I just mentioned, I had, I had no inkling to, to go in that direction. Besides the fact that it would have eaten up all the time that I wanted to put into other things. But, um, yeah, so maybe he has an index you can look up of St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, why they don't like him, them so much. Okay. Um, looks like we're getting to the end here. The canons, Ro says, the canons explicitly say that even if someone does not accept his res resignation, it is irrelevant. He has resigned. Yes, very good, bro. Thank you for that. Uh, Donald says, Father Kramer says, uh, Benedict XVI chose to resign from the munis only, which is the administration of the chair of Peter, not the chair itself. Yes, I've heard that argument. Also, he says, Francis calls him Pope, which indicates a two-pope situation which is against the Constitution of the Church and Vatican I. So issues and questions remain. Well, you want my opinion? Uh, you can call someone the Pope out of respect, okay? Just like we call President Bush the President, although he's no longer the President. Uh, you know, we use those titles as a sign of respect, not necessarily because they still hold those offices legally, okay? So that could be one reason. As far as um, him resigning from the munis only, uh, which is the administration of the chair and not the chair itself, uh, that's not the way that Benedict XVI said it when he resigned. He did not make that distinction. Uh, so unless uh, Father Kramer has a quote or a written document 
from Benedict the 16th saying, I am not resigning from the chair. I'm resigning from the administration. Let this be known to the whole Catholic world. And therefore the Pope that replaces me has no right over the chair, just the administration. Unless that's stated clearly by Pope Benedict, then I don't think Father Kramer's argument holds any water. Uh, to me, it just is another way of trying to manufacture a reason why Benedict is still the Pope without having any solid proof of it. I mean, like I said, you can think about these things all you want as possibilities for why Benedict could still be the Pope. But unless this was made clear in the transition of power, then it just holds no water, okay? So, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, Rose says, quote from Canon 332, paragraph 2, If it happens that the Roman pontiff resigns his office, it is required for validity that the resignation is made freely and properly manifested, but not that it is accepted by anyone. So there you have it. Okay, he can he can resign if he wants to, and no one can object to it. <laughs> uh, Donald says, Father Kramer and I have not read it either, but listened to him talk, says that Bergoglio was not a member of the church before his election due to long bouts of manifest heresy, so he could not be elected. Uh, book is 700 pages long, so a lot of stuff. We pray for them both. Well, let me make a comment about that, because... You know, I respect Father Kramer for being a priest of the Catholic Church, but sometimes he just goes way off on what kind of authority he really has, okay? He has no authority, Father Kramer. He's a preacher of the gospel just like everybody else. The only difference is him, with him is he's a priest. He can confect the Eucharist. He can do other sacraments, but he is not our leader. Okay, and I say that with all the respect that I can give Father Kramer. I'm not here to knock him down. I'm just here to level the playing field because what we say affects other people. Okay, I mean, we got to be aware that every time we open our mouth, and I, believe me, I, I hold myself uh, in that um, lurch just like I do everybody else. Okay, we all have to do that. But on this point that, you know, Bergoglio was not a member of the church, what right does Father Kramer have to say that? Okay? Was there uh, some kind of adjudication of this heresy that he supposedly had? I'm not saying he didn't have heresy. Okay? Evidently, there was something there that got everybody agitated. And, but, the, but the thing is, you can agitate you all you want, but if you now declare that, well, he's not a member of the church. That means you're the Pope, okay? Or you're his bishop. And that somehow there's been some trial uh, that you know of that nobody else knows of, wherein the, the adjudication came down and the bishop said, yeah, you're a heretic. We've proved it here in this uh, canonical court, and therefore you're not a member of the church. Did that ever happen? No. Okay. So no one has any right to say that Bergoglio was not a member of the church. The only time he would be not a member is when he's excommunicated by authority greater than him. And since he was bishop in Argentina, I don't know any authority greater than him except the Pope, and the Pope never excommunicated him. Okay? So, you know, come on. This is where it gets real dangerous, and, and I sympathize with us because... You know, when the shepherd is killed, the sheep are scattered. And when the scattering occurs, everybody's got an opinion about what the truth is. And then we all fight each other, okay? I mean, that's inevitable. It's going to happen. And it's happening right here, okay? But this is the warning. I mean, come on. If, if it was so easy to lose your membership in the church because someone out there said that you're a heretic, we'd all be in trouble, okay? Me especially. Yeah, a lot of people think, you know, I, I say heretical things, like when I say the old covenant is revoked. <laughs> Stuff like that, okay? Uh, yeah, they would rather have me not in the church. 
and they and they tried like crazy to get my bishop to discipline me and all this kind of stuff and they were halfway successful because he believed that the old covenant was revoked or wasn't revoked okay when i had to deal with this issue so i mean and, and if I, that was the case i would have you know gone on further canonically to defend myself but i didn't have to but you know just because someone out there says that you're not a member of the church come on the catholic church is a lot deeper than that this is what protestants do with each other all right because you disagree with me you're not you're not a christian you're not a member of the church anymore i'm going to go make my own church and so on and so on and so on they do this okay we don't want to be like them all right so there you have it all right <laughs> lawrence at the end says what is the meaning of life <laughs> all right wise guy uh, the meaning of life is to honor your creator and enjoy him forever how's that there you go that's the meaning of life anyone who hasn't come to that conclusion yet i feel sorry for it. all right so we've gone through another session here an hour and 45 minutes this time and um, so it will end tonight and tomorrow i will uh again have the pleasure of being with some of you on the principal facebook page and i will answer all your science questions and creation questions and all kinds of things like that from seven to eight uh thursday october 24th tomorrow okay and then for this program i'll see you again on october the 29th tuesday from seven to eight and we may go longer than eight but at, at that rate um at the rate we're going now, that's what's going to happen. So I look forward to seeing you on any of those days in the future. And God bless you all. Thank you for all participating in this um, little conversation. And uh, hope I have helped you in some small measure to get closer to God and enjoy your Christian life and walk accordingly. Bye-bye now.